Okay, so we are going to get started. I see a bunch of you ch chatting in the chat room. I'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, if you're seeing us on Facebook, go ahead. You can ask your questions right in the comment section of Facebook. I cannot see Facebook right now, so I will not be answering them in real time. I will answer, Lauren will uh, tell me about them. Uh, she's sitting here to my left, your right, um, and she'll, she'll read those questions out loud to us uh, during uh, the question and answer period. So feel free to write your question in the comment section of Facebook if you're seeing this on Facebook Live. If you're seeing this, however, on Zoom, uh, which is the primary spot, uh, please go and use the Q&A at the top of your screen, or maybe it's at the bottom of your screen, but it says Q&A, not the chat box, uh, please, because I won't see them, um, and I, I do want to take them from the Q&A section. So um, please click the Q&A to ask your questions. So my name is Jillian Sturdy, for those of you that don't know. This is our, our weekly webinar from crowdfundinglawyers.net, Trover G. Stody. And uh, before I get started on today's presentation, which is about equity, I really want to encourage you to come to next week's presentation, um, which is not, oh, two weeks? Every two weeks. Anyhow, what date is that? She tells me to promote the next webinar. And so, just forget it. July 15th? Yes, that way. <laughs> <laughs> if we did things perfect here, then people would be worried. <laughs> okay, only the dark. So, <laughs> so July 15th, uh, Jonathan, uh, who is a young, hot attorney uh, here at the firm, he is going to be buying a deal, or has he already bought the deal? He's He's working on it. He's buying his own deal. Um, and he's going to come on and talk about why he chose the deal, which I think is really interesting. You know, um, we try to put our money where our mouth is, so we're not just out there helping you guys buy your deals. We try to buy our own deals, too. And so Jonathan next week, uh, like I said, young guy, is going to help. So the, he's, he's younger than me. He's younger than me, and uh, he he's working on buying a deal in the Los Angeles area, and he's going to talk about why he chose this deal, what kind of deal it is, and and give you the whole kitten noodle uh, next in two weeks on July 16th. So make sure you check our Facebook page, check our mail. Uh, your if you're on our mailing list, check your your emails from us, uh, and we will get an announcement out about that. Okay. So for those of you that don't know. We are crowdfundinglawyers.net. What we do is we help entrepreneurs raise money for their deals. We don't help you raise the money, but we help you figure out how to do it, how to do it legally. But I can teach you all day long how to do it legally. It doesn't help if it's not effective, right? So we try to also help you with the effectiveness of the whole thing too, while staying within the letter of the law. And I'll tell you right now, this is a time to be on high alert. Personally, I may seem calm, cool, and collected, and you know we're having a good time with music and everything in these webinars. Um, and and I do like to joke around. I do like to have like a really you know positive outlook on life. But I will tell you, in all honesty, and this is no joke, my anxiety is through the roof lately. It is absolutely on an all-time high, um, and. You all might find that to be very suspect. Like, why, Jillian? Why would your anxiety be through the roof? Everything's going great. Everybody's out there raising money. The real estate industry is doing great. The economy is doing great. America's doing great, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But everything is cyclical, and it's feeling very 2016 right now. Um, and, and I want you to be keenly aware of that. And this is where people start taking unreasonable risks. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it. Please don't take unreasonable risks. Please don't buy deals that don't work. Please don't, you know, skirt around the rules to, to try to avoid uh, following some, some law. I, I don't care if you think the law is fair or not, and maybe it's not fair, but that doesn't give you license to break it. And I'm seeing a lot of people now um, 
not necessarily my clients, but other people out there who are out raising capital and they're just pretending that the law doesn't exist. Or maybe they don't know. And if you see something, do, do them a favor and tell them um, that they're not doing the right thing. Do that, you, you are doing them a favor. You can do it with kindness, I want you to do it with kindness, I don't want you calling the authorities on them unless of course they're actually stealing money. Um, if they're stealing money, call the authorities. But if you see somebody who's, you know, coming by it honestly and happening to, to break some rules out there, whether the rules are fair or not, tell them. Yeah, turn them on to some of our videos um, if, if you have one that that's you know relates. Or if you see something, tell tell me, um, and and I'll do a video on it, and you can send it out to your friends uh, so that they don't get in trouble. Uh, I don't want to see people coming getting into trouble. The, the, the thing that happens when this starts happening is, you know, the deal goes bad and that's bad enough, but then the authorities get involved. And what happens is, is the issuer, the person who may have skirted around these rules, what they have to end up doing is calling an attorney to defend them. And, and they have to respond to subpoenas and, and other things and investor inquiries and other attorneys. Um, so let's try to avoid that. Um, there's going to be some deals that go sideways. Uh, that that's a given. That that always happens. There's just things you don't know. You things you find out about later. Fine, but don't what don't also on top of that make it compound the situation by skirting around rules, by not following rules of general solicitation, by not having the proper documentation for your investors, by not properly vetting your investors by paying somebody to raise money for you that isn't a licensed broker-dealer. All of those things, I'm seeing those things happen right now, and it's because people are really comfortable, and I, it, again, it feels very 2006 out there, like uh, I'm feeling very Alfred E. newman -y, like what me worry. Yeah, worry, worry. And, uh, and I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't worry and get sick over this. And I'm not talking about any particular person. I'm talking about this on it macro level. So if you think I'm referring to you personally, uh, probably not. I'm talking about this on a completely macro level. But if this is hitting home, if there's something that's ringing in your ears about what I'm saying right now, fix it now. Don't wait. Fix it now. And, it, and if you need help fixing it, let me know. And I'll try, I'll do my best I can as a public service, not because I'm looking for your business uh, to try to help you out. I don't want you I don't want you out there doing the wrong thing. Okay, let's get into today's topic. I know I've, I've, I've gone on long enough about um, what some of you may think is nonsense, but I assure you that it is. So today's subject is equity rules, equity rules. Now, what does equity rule compare to what? Jillian, what does equity, how does your equity rule? Well, we, well we, we're talking about equity in terms of how it compares to debt. So, a lot of you out there probably thought, I'm going to just look for people, when you first start out in real estate investing, you probably thought, I'm going to just look for people, private money lenders, to uh, lend me money. Um, or maybe maybe if you're a, you're a, uh, a biotech company or, or just any other kind of company other than real estate, you thought, I'll, I'll sell notes and borrow money from my friends and family. And... Uh, and that may be all well and good, and maybe that's a saleable type of thing. But the reality is that um, you are, when, when you're out there selling uh, private securities and you're specifically dealing in the real estate space, you're specifically dealing in the real estate space, you have a real problem when you go out there and start um, looking for capital that is going to be paired with debt financing from a bank, okay? Banks don't like any other debt than themselves. Banks do not like any other debt other than themselves. Even if it's behind them, oftentimes a bank will really shy away from a deal that has other debt associated with it. 
And, and the other part of it is, is if you're selling unsecured promissory notes as opposed to secured promissory notes with a deed of trust or mortgage, oftentimes there's a misunderstanding with investors and issuers where the issuer might say something like, oh, I'm going to secure this with real estate, when in reality it's not secure. Um, so equity, in, on, on, if we look at our balance sheet, um, equity and debt are on the same side, right? It's assets equals uh, liabilities plus stockholders equity or plus equity, right? And so we are either equity, when we're raising private capital, we're either raising debt or we're raising equity financing. And when our equity holders are involved, this is something that they own. They're owners in the company. Whereas debt, it's something that is owed to them. So they don't have any ownership in the company, but they do have um, a, a, a debt instrument where there's an obligation to pay them. And so when we're talking about debt, about debt is other than the fact that banks in particular don't care for it. They don't like debt, before, they, they won't allow debt before them. They, that won't happen, number one. But number two, they don't like debt behind them either. Um, but beyond that, let's talk about what the obligation that you have as an issuer, as a company, as a fundraiser. What do you? What's your obligation to those who have debt versus those who have equity? Well, with debt, if you make a promise to pay a certain interest rate, you are absolutely positively obligated to pay that interest rate in most circumstances even if the money is not there. It's a contractual obligation. It's a contractual obligation. Meaning you're contracted to pay that money. Whereas with equity, you're only obligated to pay that money if A, you declare that you're going to pay that money, and B, if the money is there, so the profits are there. You don't have to necessarily pay a return on investment if there is no return on investment from, from, the, from the project or from the company or from the property, whatever it might be. So that's really important. So, so oftentimes I get from people, but Jillian, my investors need to know, they need a stated rate of return. They need to know exactly what they're gonna make, how they're gonna make it, when they're gonna pay it. They wanna be prioritized. They wanna be prioritized in payments. And what do we mean by prioritized? We mean the investors want to get paid first. We can still pay the investors first without creating this, this untenable contractual obligation. And how do we do that? We do that with a preferred return. And what do I mean by an untenable contractual obligation? Well, what I mean by that is let's use um, a single family flip as an example. This is easy to understand. A single family flip makes money when? It makes money after the rehab is done, either through sale or through rental. But during that period of time of rehab, there is no money to be made. And if the project runs over and the promissory note becomes due, there's a contractual obligation there to pay. So how can we get that investor the stated return without getting stuck in a contractual obligation that we might not otherwise be able to fill? And that is with what we call a preferred return. And banks like preferred returns. It's equity. It's not debt. So it doesn't get secured by the property. Um, these are owners, not people who are owed money. Um, and so that's why we like preferred returns. So what, does it, what is a preferred return? Well, it's a stated return. It says to the investors, look, I'm going to pay you an 8% return on your money or paying myself any of the returns, you know, the manager, the CEO, whomever. It says to your investors, I believe in this. So I'm gonna pay you a return on your money prior to paying myself. So I'm taking a risk here. It stops a runaway train. So oftentimes what I'll hear from some of my clients, like uh, you know, that are taking on really risky projects and putting up their own money, um, is that you know, I don't want to pay my investors more than market rates and if I feel like if I offer them straight equity then that could happen so for example if I have a project that has a 30% ROI um, 
then, and I split it 50 50 with my investors, they're going to get paid 15% on their money for doing nothing except writing a check where I had to do all of this work and blah, 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 blah. So we stopped the runaway train of investors making too much money if we offered, you know, just a preferred return like 8, 9, 10%. And I also like preferred returns because it can be uh, expressed in a sentence. What am I going to get? I'm, you're going to get 8% on your money that's going to be prioritized over my payments. Express in a sentence. Very easy to understand. But in some cases, you can take that preferred return and, and take it to a different level. And this is what most of my clients do. This is what most of my clients do is that they offer like a, a smaller preferred return, maybe it's anywhere from six to eight percent, generally speaking, maybe even lower than that, but six to eight percent, they say, hey, investors, I'm gonna pay you six to eight percent on your money, then I'm gonna get six to eight percent on your money, and then we're gonna split the remaining distributions. Now, I have this in one way here, just you know, pay a preferred return, match the investment to you, split the remaining distribution. That's that's one way of doing things. However, there are different ways to do this. You could pay the preferred return to the investors um, and then split whatever left over. Or you could pay the preferred return to your investors and then together with the preferred return, split whatever's remaining. There's, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but this gives your investors an opportunity to make a little more than um, to make a little more than the than just the preferred return. Now, in some cases, in some cases, I have clients who say, "No, I don't want to offer a preferred return. I just want to offer, you know, straight equity." And in this case, you uh, you would just split the equity with your investor. So your and and again, this is just an example. You can split this however you want. In this situation, I have investors are going to share 75% of the profits, whereas you would receive 25%. What's the point of all this? The point of all of this is that you can get returns to your investors without creating contractual obligations to yourself that just aggravates banks um, who are going to offer you leverage or, or some kind of debt. Um, and you also create it so that you only pay these returns when the money is available to pay the returns. You don't pay it. Um, um, because you have some kind of contractual obligation. Okay, so so then the next question I always get is, what returns are investors actually seeking? What are they returns returns are they seeking? So I get all the time like I need to be able to tell my investors that they're going to get you know twelve percent on their their money. Uh, I need to be able to tell my investors that they're going to get um, you know an ROI of percent on their money. Um, and I, I am going to tell you right now that it doesn't matter what returns investors are seeking. It does not matter. And I can already hear a bunch of you going, you don't know what you're talking about, but I assure you that I do. Uh, and let me tell you why it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter what investors want if the deal doesn't work. If you can't deliver what you promise, um, or if the results don't make you as happy as they make your investors. And, and I'm gonna break this down a little further. Uh, it makes no sense to offer your investors a 15% return on investment for a deal that is the only possibly payable. All you're going to do is aggravate your, your investors. Um, so it doesn't matter. Uh, at the end of the day, investors are going to invest not because their eyes get big. Some, some of them might invest because their eyes get big with, you know, wow, I can make that kind of money. But at the end of the day, people are going to invest with you because you, put, you provided a solution to their problem. You know, whatever that problem might be. Uh, you're trying to save for your kids' college education, and you found a way to invest in notes with, to save for college. Um, you people have money stuck in a self-directed IRA; they don't know where to put it. Uh, people can't find deals in Southern California because they live in Southern California and they want to invest in the Midwest, and you're in the Midwest, uh, and you offer that solution uh, because they can't manage the properties themselves. 
people have great um, jobs. They're not going to quit their jobs to become full-time real estate investors. There you go. Uh, uh, they want to be able to get educated on um, on multifamily real estate. They don't have time on the weekends to go to multifamily real estate investment 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 events to get the education because you know their kid plays travel baseball. Whatever the case is, you're solving a problem for them. Um, so returns are secondary and a far second to you solving their problem. Focus on solving the problem, the returns will become inconsequential in a lot of ways. Um, and something I was explaining to somebody this morning, uh, you know, if you just offer, and I'm not saying to do this, by the way, but I'm just giving you an example. It's hyperbole, if you will. If you offer 2% return on investment, you've already promised them double what they're going to make. Think about that. Think about that when you're thinking about the investment cycle you can offer. Now, my big disclaimer to that is you're not the bank. You certainly don't have the, the risk aversion that the bank has. So uh, I, I mind you when I say that, I, I say that with the utmost caution. But keep in mind, when you're offering 2% return on investment, you've already offered double what somebody could possibly make in the bank. Okay? All right. So uh, if you haven't already, I want to encourage you to get our helpful chart. Uh, this next screen is not correct. I'm going to give you something else. I want you, it says helpful chart and subject line to Jillian at Crowdfunding Lawyers on it. Don't do that. Actually, send a text to 36260 with crowd in the text. Crowd in the text to 36260. Um, and then you'll get all text stuff. So, all right. With that, I am ready for your questions. Um, this is the end of my part of the presentation. If you would like to ask questions, uh, please use the Q&A box at the top of or the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you're on Facebook, you can just put it in the comments there and I'll be happy to answer your questions. And I'm sure some of you have questions. And we had so many questions last time uh, for the last webinar that I still have an answer. And the life coach is going to kill me over that. Let me see. Hold on. If you guys aren't going to, I'm going to questions. If you guys aren't going to ask me questions, I'll just ask questions that I didn't answer from the last webinar. Uh, this is my searching for questions. Okay, Rick's asking, read preferred return. Does a typical structure require 100% capital return prior to sponsor participation in annual distributions? Uh, in, in other words, 8% preferred return ten, deal generates 10% cash and cash per year. Does it Sponsor typically share the agreed split on the 2% delta, or do they have to defer until the debt investor's initial investment return is returned? You absolutely do not need to do that. Uh, no, I do have clients who do do that. I don't necessarily recommend it. I don't recommend anybody working for free for an extended period of time. It just breeds contempt. Um, so I, I prefer that you wouldn't do that necessarily unless the deal um, provides for that. I saw an interesting deal structure the other day that totally works for a certain deal that I'm working on right now, where the sponsor offers to, um, like, it's, it's an 80-20 split, essentially. So 80% of the distributions will get paid to the investors until they've returned a full return of capital. The other 20% goes, or it's 90-10, something like that. But it, and the other 10% will go to the manager to pay them for their time. So, so the, and then it kind of switches where it goes to 70, 30 after the investors have received their total return of capital. Um, so uh, so the, the short answer to your question, Rick, is no. And, and this, is, this is governed by you. And it's governed by you 
and by the deal. So the deal governs it, and then you decide based on the deal numbers what's going to work for you. Okay? Okay. So Leonard's asking, uh, you said debt not preferred when sponsor using bank debt also. Other than timing, which you touched on, if no debt at project level, still any downside to offering debt over equity? Yes, yes. Like I said, um, when you offer debt as opposed to offering equity, you are creating a contractual obligation for yourself. So whether the project or not makes money doesn't matter. You're still going to owe that money to your investors if you offer debt. So like if you say I'm going to pay you 10% interest and it's going to pay, it's going to, I'm going to start paying payments one year from today. Um, when one year comes up, you owe them that money, whether the money is there or not, you owe them the money on your debt. That's why I don't like debt, I, especially with high risk real estate projects, um, because because you're creating a contractual obligation for yourself that, you know, through no fault of your own, you may not be able to, to perform on. And what, are, what do I mean by through no fault of your own? Well, let's just say you need a particular permit from a particular city to do a particular thing on a particular property, and you can't get the permit for quite some time. I have this happening right now with one of my clients, actually. They, 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 they can't get a particular permit. And because they can't get a particular permit, uh, they're, uh, they're delayed on paying back their investors. Okay. So I just uh, want to get that one. Okay. So Elise is asking, being an investor, do I want equity or debt if I have a chance to do either? It, you know what? The world is your oyster. Um, you've got to just determine what you like. I prefer to be an equity investor, and I also ask for, especially if it's a property deal, I prefer to be an equity investor because I want depreciation. I'm not just necessarily looking for cash flow, I'm looking for depreciation. I also know myself, um, and I don't want to sue anybody. And and if somebody doesn't perform on note, a note or a debt obligation, that means I have to get up and do work to sue them. And I don't want to do that. I mean, it's the same for equity too if they don't end up paying me, but whatever, at least they know what I'm in for. So um, I don't particularly care. I, I mean, if, if, I'm a, if I'm an equity investor, there's a chance that I can come in and take over the company. If I'm a debt investor, there is no chance of that. I don't know of the company. So personally, I prefer equity for a boatload of reasons. Um, you know, if I really improve, if I really believe in the project, I would invest otherwise. So that's why I want to do equity. Number one, number two, uh, I want depreciation. So, and so I usually ask for that in a lot of deals that I'm in. Can you talk about platforms like Seed Invest, CrowdStreet, et cetera? Could they, uh, could they ever a good idea? I, I, I'm going to interpret your question, Chris, if you don't mind. I think what you're asking me is, is it a good idea to be on a platform like Seed Invest, CrowdStreet? Etc. I've invested on quite a few of these platforms. Um, it works for some, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, it really just depends on what you're trying to do, who you are, and where your crowd is. Uh, these, these platforms, I will tell you this much, are not magic bullets for your deals. Uh, you know, like they're not, just because you get listed on them doesn't mean you're going to raise money necessarily. So, so just keep that in mind before going forward with any of these, these kinds of companies, for sure. If someone wants to raise money for buying established with small business like coffee shop, et cetera, which structure would make sense? Buy by 60 or do you know the best way? Uh, ben, it's all about your crowd. If you have a crowd of people who are friends and family, then no, 506C would not make the most sense. 506B would make much better sense for you um, because those are people you know and they might not necessarily be accredited. You can kind of take up to 35 in an investor. Money you know is always better than you don't know, and the statistics support that. 93% of offerings done under Regulation B are done under 506B, as in Boyd, not 506C as in Charles. And for those of you that don't know, 506B as in Boyd does not allow general solicitation, but allows you to raise as much money as you want from both accredited and up to 35 sophisticated investors, where 506C allows you to do general solicitation and raise money from an unlimited number of accredited investors. However, you must verify that those investors are accredited, and a lot of times it's hard to get those investors to accredit accredited so just keep or verify that they're accredited. Can you please share the texting information again? I sure can. It's text crowd to 36260. Crowd to 36260. I am new to syndication and crowdfunding. 
would you recommend for me to backfill a current investment that I've already stabilized in order to create a track record for myself? Uh, no, not necessarily. Not unless you want to. Not unless you want to like, you know, leverage that property to buy more properties. Um, you know, your track record is how many properties have you invested, not necessarily how much money have you raised. Um, so, you know, the best track records are those people who went out, risked their own money, and now they're saying, I'm so confident in this that I'm, I'm uh, and I've had this track record of, of success with my own money that I'm ready to move on to bigger and better deals and I need, I need my friend's family um, to help me out with, with making that come true. Is there anything I should be aware of that is different from what you have already stated for new construction on multifamily projects? No, I'm really, when, I, when I'm giving this presentation, uh, you know, there's a huge, loud booming. Uh, this, this, I'm talking to you new construction people, you know, because that is where the greatest risk is, is new construction. That's where the greatest delays could potentially be is new construction. So, so that's why I'm really against, you know, private debt on on new construction type projects because you just don't know what boogeymen are in that closet um, so you really want to be very very careful uh, when it comes to dealing with debt investors on new construction I, I i totally recommend that you do not have debt investors on new construction quite frankly um you know just be aware and if you do do debt on new construction with private investors make sure it's convertible debt um and still be very careful with that make sure that you have control over the convertible debt. Will you be sending the recording to us was late in this part of the presentation? Hey, don't even worry. It's on Facebook. It's streaming on Facebook right now, Facebook Live, and it will be there later. So if you just go to the crowdfunding lawyers page, you will find the video there. It's actually streaming on my personal page right now, um, but I will share it to the crowdfunding lawyers page as soon as we're done here. So that was my last question on Zoom. Lauren, do you have any questions on Facebook? She doesn't have any. Wow, Facebook, thanks for the love. <clears throat> yeah. uh, I, I have one last question from Sam here. I have invested in 10, six, 10 syndications. None of them checked my accreditation. Sam, that's okay. Those, those 10 syndications all could have been under Rule 506B, so maybe they didn't need to check your accreditation. Um, the question is, did they ask you if you're accredited? So think about that. Uh, and and I, I, again, I don't know where uh, you invested from. So uh, I just accidentally think I clicked on somebody. Oh, okay. All righty. Well, I, that is all my questions you guys had to ask today. Be sure to attend Jonathan's webinar in two weeks on July 16th about why he's buying a deal in Los Angeles or outside of Los Angeles or near Los Angeles, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and uh, thanks everybody for coming out and spending the morning with me or afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, oh, I want you guys to remember to check out. Oh, Lauren's giving me messages from around the side. I really need cue cards. In the future, we'll have cue cards. I'm working on those. So, anyhow. Uh, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, definitely check out our YouTube channel for a couple of reasons. Um, and you, I, a lot of the videos that we have on YouTube are also on Facebook, but check out the YouTube channel. Please subscribe. I've been doing this thing, this segment for probably a year or two now called People You Should Know, and I'm getting better and better at it. Not to toot my own heart, but I am. I'm getting better and better at this segment. I'm, be I'm asking better questions of my guests, but not only that, um, my guests have always been really great. I've always had I've always had the great fortune of having really amazing guests who, who deliver really great content on that People You Should Know series. But the but the content is even getting better. And I just did a uh, People You Should Know recently with Frank McKinney, who is a is a real estate artist. If you don't know him, um, you have to check out that People You Should Know. Uh, there's not just business lessons in there, but massive life lessons in that people you should know. I thought I was going to cry when it was over. So uh, uh, please check that people you should know out. Um, and I have another people you should know coming up that I'm incredibly excited about. Um, and so I want you to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can get notified of that. Um, also, 
we have. I just created this new series called Private Money Minutes, um, and those are also on our YouTube channel. Um, those are also on our Private Money Rockstar uh, Facebook page, so check those out as well. Gene uh, Trowbridge, my partner, does this great segment called Most Asked Questions, um, where he answers your most asked questions in a variety of different videos. He uses a whiteboard, um, and we're gonna be adding uh, new content every week, so check out YouTube, check out Facebook. We're on the gram. We're not very good about the gram, so. Okay. Yeah. I got I think I gotta I gotta I gotta lose about ten to twenty years to get through the program. I'm very youthful. I know. I look about twenty five years old. The acne. I get it. <laughs> but believe it or not, I'm actually forty five. No, 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 thank you. Yes, no. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great rest of your week. Happy 4th of July, everyone. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.